Okay, so I'm going to talk about what's called on-bill finance. And any of, the, of you who have been around the energy, energy efficiency market will know that um, in the UK we've called it Green Deal. And I'm going to cover that as we go through and why I still think that Green Deal actually should have some legs. But there are some issues. And I will go the right way. The issue we've covered is around this landlord-tenant disincentive. Yeah? The landlord pays for the energy efficiency improvements. The tenant gets the lower energy costs. So how do we, how do we crack that? We heard from you, Ernest, that, that there's a big part of the sector out there who are grappling with that issue. What, what can people do about it? You know, the simple thing is, well, if I'm going to reduce your energy bill, and it assumes that the tenant clearly is paying the energy bill, not always the case, I'll just increase the rent because I'm going to do up your building and, of course, I can put your rent up because I'm going to pay the extra cost. Now, we all know how easy that is to go to a tenant and put up the rent. So, clearly, not the easy way that people have taken. Green leases. Does anyone here have ever done a green lease? Anyone put their hand up? One green lease. Two. Oh, three, four, five. Good. Some green leases, which I see as a variation around that theme. But to me, it's, it is a, one of the ways of doing it when you look at it. But, of course, it means establishing a new lease and a new agreement with the tenant. And it's all part of bringing out most of the issues around leases, not just around the energy efficiency side. You could try and ask the tenant to pay. Look, tenant, you're going to be better off. Why wouldn't you pay for this? Most pushback from the tenant comes is that they're not sure they might be in the building for as long as the payback period. I mean, payback on energy efficiency, can, short term, can be two to three years, but can be out five, six, seven years. And of course, many of the tenant tenancy agreements, many of the leases, don't last that long. So you're unlikely to find tenants who want to do that. <clears throat> we've we've um, dealt with some tenants who are in uh, uh, NGO space who feel they have a moral obligation to reduce carbon emissions. And they find it very difficult to do that because they have not got long leases on their buildings. And so they, they even though they want to reduce their energy bills, even though they want to reduce their emissions, they can't justify it to their trustees because they don't have that length of tenure. A lot of the feedback I get from the industry is that, um, well, we'll do it as part of our refurbishment program. It's, it's going to happen anyway. We're going to refurbish this building in the next five years. We will do it up then, and then we'll, we'll bundle all the costs for energy efficiency into the overall refurbishment, and then we'll have a higher-grade building, and we'll be able to get it back through the rent, we hope. Now, I mean, that sounds good. There's, there's two issues about it. One is that um, if you look at the speed of refurbishment, it doesn't match the speed of reduction in carbon emissions required by the UK PLC. So if we went at the pace of, of the way we do our buildings, we would still have a lot of our buildings emitting far too much energy and uh, too much carbon emissions. So it's not quite fast enough. The other issue is actually, well, what happens if you could do a refurbishment program and you could get your tenant to pay for some of it because some of that is energy efficiency? I was talking to a, a property manager the other day who runs an industrial fund. And I said, look, we'll come on to on-bill finance, but why don't you get tenants to help pay for it? And he goes, well, actually, I need to spend about two or three grand doing up the boilers. It's not a lot, and I don't really want to go through the hassle of doing that. He said, mind you, the roofs, I've got to put new roofs on all my, all my industrial estates, and that's 100 grand or so a pop. So that's quite a big bit. And I said, well, how much of the new roof is energy efficiency? He said, well, about 30% probably, 30% of the cost. So I said, if you could get someone else to pay for that upgrade that is energy efficiency, would that be useful? He went, yeah, actually, that would be useful. Um, I haven't heard back, mind you, but it's one of those ideas where you sort of strike a slight chord, but I think it often goes into the difficult box. And then the final one, which I'm going to really talk about, is, is on-bill finance, so on the electricity, on the energy bill. So the idea is the finance is paid by a finance party, and the bill payer, which in most buildings, and bear with me on this, let's assume it's always the tenant, the tenant who's paying the energy bill, the electricity bill generally, pays it back over the electricity bill. So the tenant who is the beneficiary of the upgrade pays back through the electricity bill, and you take away the landlord-tenant disincentive. And because the tenant doesn't have to worry about tenure, because if that tenant moves, another, another one moves in, they carry on paying the bill, there is this less of a worry about the tenant think, hang on, I'm going to get screwed here because if I have to move next year, I won't have paid out, got my money back. So how does it work? 
We start with a, a landlord and a tenant in a building. An installer comes along and says to the landlord and the tenant, look, I'll do the work on the building. Landlord, are you happy with that? But the tenant's going to pay it back over the energy bill. And he gets agreement both from landlord and tenant because there's a win-win story there. The installer has a finance party sitting behind him who says, look, when you've signed up and you've got that cash flow coming through, I will pay you for the work, so I will buy your receivables. So I know I'm going to get over a five-year, ten-year, whatever the, the paint repayment period is, I'm going to get that money over the electricity bill. The tenant gets the lower energy bills and therefore is happy to repay over the electricity meter and the electricity company then passes on the money to the finance party. That is UK legislation that they have to do that under Green Deal. They have no choices. I also know some voluntary agreements coming through. Probably the voluntary agreements on this is that you, if you switch electricity company, you have to pay it back. Now what happens is a new tenant moves in, the new tenant takes on the bill and carries on paying. Overall, they're better off. And so what you get is a landlord gets a building upgraded to be more energy efficiency, more energy efficient at no cost. It's paid for by the tenant who is better off for doing so. The only losers are the energy companies, and we don't really care about that. From a finance story, what does that look like? Well, people in finance, you know, credit committees, they're always pretty miserable. They go, what's the worst case? What's going to go wrong? Who takes what risk? So if you look at the hierarchy of risk within this relationship here, you have initially, is the tenant going to pay the bill? So is that tenant good for paying the bill? Now, the good thing is electricity bills are generally one of the last to default on because you don't want your power turned off. But they might go bust. They may not pay their bills. And so the finance party is taking the risk that they will not pay their bill until they're thrown out of the building and then the landlord, who then becomes the bill payer or the meter, takes that on. So the landlord has some liability during the times of void. Gets a new tenant in, landlord starts paying, off we go. Now, the landlord, if they went bust, then whoever takes on the building, whoever's got security over that building, presumably some mortgage if they're going bust, they then take on the ownership of that building. They then have to carry on paying that electricity bill. And we come down to the story of what we call stranded building risk. You do go to some parts of the country, um, often in the northeast. I was going around Billingsgate a couple of years ago, and it struck me how many abandoned buildings there were. So it's an abandoned building where people throw away the keys and say, I don't want anything to do with it. Creditors don't want it. So, so when we've spoken to the finance guys about this, they've said, look, let's start off with a good credit-rated landlord, because we know they're unlikely to go bust, and in an area where we're not going to see stranded building risk because then we're pretty confident that we will get our money back. Now, what you're then having is a finance party saying, I am taking the risk not on energy efficiency. I'm taking the risk on people's ability to pay their electricity bill. I'm taking the same risk as an electricity company. And Stephen's gone, I think, hasn't he? So if we, no, he's there. Stephen, so in this, I don't need your energy efficiency standards, because all I'm doing is securitizing against the ability to pay an electricity bill. Now, it sounds very easy, but that, when we're talking to finance parties about this, they're saying, I need to get my head around electricity bill payments. I don't need to get my head around energy efficiency. And so we start changing the story from a finance sector point of view. What am I taking risk against? Now, landlords and tenants, clearly we need permission from both parties to do it. So the sales speech to the landlord is, hey, you're getting your building upgraded, and we know legislation F and G, you need to do that. It's not going to cost you anything, but your tenant's going to have lower bills, so isn't that going to be an attractive sale into the, into the market? Okay, there's a couple of downsides. You are exposed, exposed to void costs. So if you're exposed to void costs, what is your void rate, average void rate? If it's as high as 10% and you're spending 100 grand on a building, then you are going to spend ten, effectively be hit by 10%. So you're spending 10 grand on a building to get 100 grand's worth of work. That's a good deal. Sometimes landlords said to me, well, a, a tenant might object to having this payment on the electricity bill. And you go, okay, they're going to object to having lower bills. That sounds a bit irrational. 
but it's one of the things which we have not tested, and Ina would stand there saying, yeah, it's something we need to test. For the tenant, they get lower energy bills. They get lower energy bills during the payment period, but of course, if they stay there a long time, once they've paid off the finance part, then they get even lower bills. And they can share the cost of the upgrade with future tenants. It's not all on their watch. It's not why they're in the building. And therefore, actually, you could spread this repayment over 5, 10, 15, 20 years, depending on the finance sector. Which And stop thinking about payback periods. Payback periods are irrelevant. Is my bill going to be lower next year, yes or no? I don't care whether it pays back in 20 years if next year's bill is lower. And then you start changing the dynamic of the conversation. Some tenants say to me, well, look, oh, shouldn't the landlord be doing this? It's their building, after all. They're going to get a benefit. They've got to do it. And so sometimes some, one of the landlords I speak to said, well, actually, we might contribute towards it. Because sometimes you do the maths and you find the tenant isn't actually going to be better off or not enough to make it compelling. And if the landlord chips in, then reduces the overall cost, then that brings the tenant in. And so you're basically sharing the upgrade rather than doing it 100%. So this was all Green Deal. And I say was because actually people seem to have written it off. I don't think it is written off. The legislation is still in place and we'll come on to this. What has not happened is there hasn't been demand for it in the uh, non-domestic space. Domestic space, I think, was actually a huge success. £50 million was done, 9,999 properties. Greg Barter wanted to get to 10,000. He didn't quite manage it. Mind you, that was the first year. Um, but if anyone had set up a finance business for consumer finance and done £50 million in the first two to three years, they would have been quite pleased with the take-up. Unfortunately... Um, that's not the way most people looked at it. So Green Deal, which is all this is based on, said, look, energy efficiency and renewable energy investments can be recovered via a charge on the electricity bill, on bill of finance. So there's a thing called the golden rule, which the bill pair needs to be better off in year, year one after the cost of finance. Well, it makes sense. If you want your tenant to take it up and agree with it, then they should be better off. The beneficiary is the bill pair. Bill pair must be better off. The big six energy companies are obliged to collect it, and actually three more of the outside the big six signed up to it. So you can still switch at least between nine companies because they just switch the payment plan. Some smaller companies might be a problem, but you could just actually get, bring them into the system as a Green Deal uh, collector. The important bit I mentioned is a charge transfers to a new bill pair, so the tenant moves, it moves to the new tenant. So that means you get these long-term contracts. And the landlord is responsible during time of voids, hence the finance guys say they don't pick up void risk. Landlords, after all, that's their job, picking up void risk. Where are we? My font size seems to have gone a bit erratic, but anyway. Um, legislation is in place. The legislation stands. What the government has done is withdrawn finance to the Green Deal Finance Party which was a not-for-profit set up by various bodies to provide finance to the domestic market. That is the only thing the government has done so far to kill off Green Deal. Electricity companies can collect payments. Now, they have not collected one payment yet for non-domestic, and trying to get an answer out of them of whether they can or cannot do it is quite tricky. In Energy UK, their um, industry body, says they will obey the legislation. Um, which means, to me, risk, we would need to check that they really can collect payments, but they are obliged by law to do it. The supply chain has the cap capability to deliver it. There are companies out there who want to do this sort of work. From the finance sector, there is good interest. When we did, I did this work with the Scottish Government, with Birmingham City Council, I went round to a number of finance parties and said, would you be interested in taking this sort of risk, providing this sort of finance? And they said, yeah, look, that looks like a good way to collect money, but we need to see, some said 1 million, some said 2 million, some said 5 million, one said 30 million. We need to see pipeline. For a fund manager to set up a new fund could cost about half a million pounds worth of costs. Legal fees, IT, recruiting, except raising money, blah, blah, blah. So they don't want to come to the party till they're sure there is pipeline. They've been burnt by that in the past. They need to see project. And around the country, there has been interest. Local authorities are interested... Not all of them, but a number of them. And the good thing about local authorities is that they actually own, in some places, 5 to 10% of the local, locally let commercial properties. And so they're a landlord. And so they're going to have obligations. And so they were trying to work out how to do it. 
The Scottish Government, I spent um, a number of months going up and down to, to Edinburgh and around Scotland, they were looking for a solution for um, the, uh, the Scottish market. The, their view is that this is a supply chain issue, could we get finance in? Again, local authorities we were engaging with, Glasgow, for instance, has its own property company, very interested in doing it. Some private sector property owners. There was a bit of pushback from some of the large firms who sort of go, oh, no, no, we don't do Green Deal, that's, that's for the small people. But actually, when you say to them, look, this is just a way of using someone else's money to do what you're building and, and collecting it, there, then there is some increasing interest. But people need to get their head around it. And then, of course, got, we got the incoming legislation, which an analysis describes about minimum energy performance standards, or MISAs, I think it's now called. Um, and that will then focus people's mind. If they're going to have to do their buildings, then is this a good way to do it? But the whole question really is about pipeline. This is not about lack of finance. I could, if someone came to me today with five million pounds worth of work to be done in this manner, we would get the finance. It's about finding the pipeline. And that is our problem because the industry doesn't seem to want to do it. I think the industry is very supply driven, by the way. If you look at it, it's all about the installers wanting to do work and the finance want to do it. It's actually, we need to become more demand driven, which is perhaps where the legislation is coming in. So what next? We need some clarity from the government. I think the, the removal of finance from the Green Deal finance company has made people say the Green Deal is dead. But the legislation, we think, is still in place. Um, the supporting bodies, I think, looking at us, are still in place. Green Deal Orb, GemServe, they've still got the, the, the ability to run this. It could do with removing some barriers on things like the Golden Rule. I went to DEC and said... Can you remove the golden rule for businesses? They know what they're doing. They can work out whether they want to make payback more quickly or not. Can we include feed-in tariffs as, a, as a, achieving the golden rule? And can we, one other question, they went, no, no, no. There are some ways of simplifying this which would remove the barriers. But also making sure that um, minimum energy performance standards, or MIS, has some teeth to it. One of my concerns when I look at the legislation is the landlord can go to a tenant and say, do you want to do this? The tenant goes, no, and they go, okay, I tried. I'm walking away. So, so there are some issues around that. I think re-engaging with local authorities and helping them kickstart the market, the proactive local authorities out there, and, and there are some really good ones. There's Bristol, there's um, uh, Manchester, West Sussex, who's a client of mine, really want to get this going and they would put in their commercially let properties to kickstart this. Scotland, a lot of interest. A lot of it, they've had the wind taken out of their sails because of all, I think it's the 13 or 15 different changes in legis green legislation since the Tories came to power, and they've all lost a bit of heart around this. So if we could come back and say to them, no, this is really important, and this mechanism still exists, then it might um, help kickstart the market. And finally, property owners, property managers, start to take the energy efficiency so seriously. You know, one reasonable sized firm, I'm sure, could put together and find um, a reasonable number of projects to bring to the party. Someone came in with a million, two million pounds worth of properties. I know a finance party would say, OK, this is now starting to become interesting. So really, the thought I want to leave with you is, is two things. One is finance and a finance mechanism, I think, is there, or almost there. What we're lacking is pipeline and projects. And that is the biggest problem of this market, is finding the pipeline and projects to make it happen. And I think that's the end of my answer.